Hello, welcome back to another episode of the Self Development with Tech Takes podcast. As you can see, once again in the background, Tim Ferriss and the, the Tim Ferriss Show, with the latest episode being, by the way, for all the podcast listeners, Dr. Andrew Weil, W E I L, the 478 Breath Method, Cannabis, Uses of Coca Leaf, Rehabilitation, Demonized Plants and so on and so forth a bit more to it and it is number 615 apparently i don't know if this is correct maybe it is a well i don't know but here we have the path to better thinking through puzzles and riddles um very interesting especially because i think and very recently i i also thought about that and therefore I also thought about writing more because writing apparently and it makes sense why um, does clear your thinking quite a bit because when you're writing something you really have to think hard and you really have to clearly know what you're trying to say and what you're saying and what you're thinking and period the following is a guest post from A.G. Jacobs a best-selling author journalist and human guinea pig it is excerpted from his new book, The Puzzler, One Man's Quest to Solve the Most Baffling Puzzles Ever, From Crosswords to Jigsaw to the Meaning of Life. AJ has written four-time New York bestsellers, including The Year of Living Biblically, for which he followed all the rules of the Bible as literal as possible, and Thanks a Thousand, for which he went around the world and thanked every person who had even the smallest role in making his morning cof cup of coffee possible. He has given four TED Talks with a combined 10 million views, well, 10 million plus views. He contributed to NPR and the New York Times and wrote the article My Outsourced Life, which was featured in the 4-Hour Workweek. He was once the answer to one down in the New York Times crossword, uh, crossword puzzle. You can find my interview from 2016 with AJ here. And you can find last week's interview with AJ here as well. It is linked. Um, the article, once again, is called The Path to Better Thinking Through Puzzles and Riddles. And it is from April 25th, actually 2022. So it is a rather new article. There are not too many articles as far as I know here on this site. Enter AJ. My father was one to introduce me to math puzzles. He didn't focus on the traditional kind. His were weirder than that more homegrown. My dad's greatest joy comes from baffling, unsuspecting people. <laughs> Strangers, friends, family, whomever. And he often accomplished this with mass bast based hijinks. One time when I was about eight years old, I asked my dad how fast race cars went. This was before Google, so my father was my version of a search engine. The fastest ones get up to about 50 million, my dad said. Even to my aunt's cold mind, 50 million miles per hour seemed off. That doesn't sound right, I said. Yes, it is, he said, 50 million fat hums per fortnight. <laughs> I just stared at him. Oh, you wanted miles per hour? My dad said, I thought you meant in fat hums per fortnight. As you might know, a fat hum equals six feet and a fortnight is two weeks. My dad had decided that fat hums per fortnight would be his default way to measure speed on the probably correct theory that no one else on earth had ever used that metric. I thanked him for his helpful information. So, as you can see, I was exposed to recreational math early on leaving me with a mixed legacy, a love of number, a healthy skepticism about numbers and paranoia. For this puzzle project, I've bought a dozen books with math and logic brain teasers. Reading these books often induces a mild panic. How would I know how many spheres can simultaneously touch a center? Sphere? I can't even figure out where to start. What is the entry point? To remedy this problem, I decided to consult one of the world's greatest on math puzzles, hoping to learn some of her methods. Tanya Kovanova, I guess. Reads me on video call, but before I am allowed to ask her anything, she has a question for me. I have two coins, she says in a Russian accent. Together they add up to 15 cents. One of them is not a nickel. What are the two coins? My palms begin to sweat. I didn't expect a pop quiz. Maybe she's talking about foreign coins, maybe rubbles or are evolved. 
I say. No foreign coins, she says, American currency. I employ one of the puzzle solving strategies that I do know. Look closely at all of the words and see if you have fallen for any hidden assumptions. Two coins add up to 15 and one of them is not a nickel. The last phrase is kind of ambitious. She didn't say neither of them are nickels. So what if one is not a nickel, but the other one is? A dime and a nickel? I say tentatively because the other one is a nickel. Okay, you passed the test, so you can continue, she smiles. This is a relief because Tanya is a fascinating character. She is a Russian emigre who is no, uh, I'm sorry, now a lecturer at MIT. She writes a popular blog about the world's twistiest math and logic puzzles. It's called simply Tanya uh, Kovanova's math blog. And she has cracked pretty much every great math problem ever created. We're talking coin puzzles, matchstick arranging puzzles, river crossing puzzles and math education puzzles. I'm sorry, equation puzzles. Tanya is on a mission. I am very upset at the world, she says. There is so much faulty thinking and puzzles can help us think better. Consider probability, she says. We are terrible at thinking probabilistically and puzzles about odds can help us learn. They could teach us, for instance, the follow of playing the lottery. I'm sorry, the folly of playing the lottery. The situation is unethical. I think that the lottery organizers should spend part of the money they make on lotteries to educate people not to play the lottery. Tanya has been fascinated with math since her childhood in Moscow. The first thing that I remember, it wasn't a puzzle, it was an idea. I remember that I was five years old and we were on a vacation in the village and I was trying to go to sleep and I was thinking of each number there is the next number and then there is the next number. At some point I realized that there should be an infinite of numbers and I had this feeling like I am touching infinity, I am touching the universe, just a euphoric feeling. Being a female Jewish math genius in 1970s Soviet Russia was not easy. She faced sexism and anti-Semitism. Tanya says the test for the prestigious Moscow State University, the Soviet equivalent of MIT, was rigged against Jews. Jewish students were given a separate and more difficult test. The problems were called coffin problems, which translates to killer problems. Tanya studied with other Jewish students and managed to pass the unfair test. In 1990, Tanya left Russia. She moved to the United States and married a longtime American friend. She worked for a defense contract near Boston, but hated it because I thought it destroyed my karma. She started teaching as a volunteer at MIT before they hired her as a full-time lecturer. Her philosophy, puzzles should be used more often in teaching math. First of all, they entertain us while teaching us how to think rigorously. Second, puzzles can lead to genuine advances in mathematics. Topics such as conditional probability and topology were originally explored in puzzle form. So there's actually a tiny bit more to it. I don't think that I'm going to be able to finish it today, but still, I want to go through Math Puzzles 1.0. The very first math puzzle, at least according to some scholars, date back to Egypt's Rind Papyrus, I guess, about 1500 BCE. They are closer to problems than puzzles since they don't require much in ingenuity, but the unnamed author did try to spice them up with some whimsical details such as in problem 79. So there we have problem 79 in front of us. There are seven houses. In each house there are seven cats. Each cat kills seven mice. Each mouse has eaten seven grains of barley. Each grain would have produced seven hecat which is a unit of measurement apparently, what is the sum of all the enumerated things? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, wouldn't it be, no, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, wouldn't it be 7, uh, not times 7, but 7, what is it called? Um, I think you know what I mean. Arguably the first book with actual twisty and turny math puzzles came several centuries later, the 9th century Holy Roman Emperor Giles Mann was a puzzle addict and he hired a British scholar named Alcuin of York to be his official puzzle maker. Alcuin's book Problems to Sharpen the Young introduced, among other things, the first known river crossing problem. Here it is. 
A man has to transport a wolf, a goat, and a bunch of cabbage across a river. His boat could take only two of these at a time. How can he do this without leaving the wolf alone with the goat, as he might eat it, or the goat alone with the cabbage, as it might eat them? For river crossing problems, you need to realize that you must take a counterintuitive step backward before continuing forward. You must think outside the box. The way outside the box. Tanya reminds me that thinking outside of the box wasn't always a cliché. The origin of the phrase is an actual puzzle. Connect all the dots in this diagram using just four straight lines. The answer is this one. Indeed, thinking about... Uh, thinking outside the box. Now as the phrase is overused and is often a punchline as in the cartoon of the cat thinking outside its litter box, but it is still an important concept to find a solution, you often have to break expectations. My students have taught me as much as I have taught them about this, she says. How do you mean, I ask? She tells me to think about the puzzle. You have a basket containing five apples. You have five hungry friends. You give each of your friends an apple. After distribution, each of your friends has one apple yet. There is an apple remaining in the basket. How can that be? The traditional answer is you give your friends an apple and then hands the fifth friend the basket with the apple still in it. So each friend has an apple and there is still one in the basket. For that answer, you have to think out of the box, says Tanya. But when students have come up with answers that are even farther out of the box. Their suggestions include one friend already has an apple, you kill one of your friends, you are narcissistic and you are your own friend, the friend who didn't get an apple stops being your friend, an extra apple falls from the tree to the basket, and Tanya's favorite, the basket is your friend. We should not discount people's emotional connection with inanimate objects. The lesson my students taught me is that I am good at thinking in such a box, but I realized I'm inside my own bigger box, and maybe we all are. We probably all are. Um, I would like to go through all of it, um, but I'm going to do it the next time, I would say. Up until then, I wish you the best, and hopefully see you soon. Bye-bye.